Hey folks, I'm back and this is the first video in this series. Uh, this is the new series that I've started which you already know about. And uh, as I told that in the previous interviews which I took, uh, I have started reaching out to everyone whom I have interviewed and I'm getting their permission and I'm getting their consent. So uh, this is the first win in the series. In I remember, if I remember correctly, uh, the person I interviewed uh, has given two to three rounds and I have all the recordings on my channel for this. So I'll be working on them, uh, reframing them, uh, making a bit change in, in the voices so that uh, you cannot recognize. And this person was on Kubernetes. So exactly uh, Kubernetes questions and nothing else on these questions. So this is the one thing that I've started again. And I'm going through all the videos. I'm filtering out everything. And uh, uh, if I won't be able to get the uh, permission from the person who I have interviewed, I won't be posting that. So this is the person who has given me uh, the permission. And I think I have one or two more interviews of her. All right. So uh, I have again used the same video. And from uh, when this video will jump cut, you will see the older recording. All right. So uh, yeah, that's about it. So let's jump into that recording. Hey folks, my name is Ravish and welcome back to another video in the series of DevOps interviews. Now, the interview that I have taken today, this is one of the best interview that I have ever taken. And this, uh, this person is having around four years of experience in DevOps and four years of experience in IT and four years of experience in cloud. So she has started her career in DevOps only as a fresher and then she was an amazing candidate and this was the second round and we were looking for someone who is well versed in Kubernetes. So uh, the whole interview is uh, concentrated on Kubernetes. We have asked a few scenario based questions. We have asked a lot of questions around 15 to 20 questions and this interview is dedicatedly on around 30 minutes uh, for the Kubernetes part and hands down this is the best interview, one of the best interview I have taken in recent times. The candidate knew almost all of the things. I mean, in my in the course of around 10, uh, 15, 20 questions, there was only one question that uh, she was not aware about. Uh, uh, apart from that, everything was perfect and on point. So uh, kindly take, uh, take a look at this video and learn, take out your pen and paper, learn from it and write down all of these questions and because they're going to help you in the future. All right. So uh, again, uh, watch the video till the end and uh, subscribe to the channel because uh, it really motivates me to create more content like this. So without further ado, let's get started. Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. How are you today? Uh, I'm fine. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. So, uh, can you please uh, give, give me a brief introduction about yourself? Okay, uh, so I am graduated from VIT University uh, in 2018 with 9.2 CGPA. And then I got campus placement in one of the product based company. And there I worked for two years. Uh, I have worked on some of the technologies like uh, I have worked on Jenkins, Bash, Bash scripting. I have also learned some Python there. And then after two years, I shifted to another company that is almost like service based company. There I basically worked on uh, Sonar cubes, and I have also created an environment from scratch, like one one of the QA environment. And yeah, and now currently I'm one, in one of the another product based company, and there I am as cloud operation engineers. And my main role is to like uh, look into infrastructure, and the main application on which I'm uh, working is Kubernetes. And along with Kubernetes, I'm working on Grafana, Loki, Prometheus, yeah, these kind of things. But basically on Kubernetes. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so your total years of experiences? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, my total year of experience is four years. Four years, okay. And how much in cloud? Same. Four years, great. Uh, I have worked on Azure DevOps, basically. Azure, Azure and Azure DevOps, okay. And in DevOps, how much? Same, same only. Oh, you started your career as a DevOps? Yeah. Okay, I mean, it's... Very rare to find people who have started their career as a DevOps, but yeah, great. Uh, okay, so I uh, I have gone through your resume and it looks really good. And this is the second round and I have got really good. Uh, 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 the person who took your interview uh, gave a good feed feedback. Okay, so uh, as you have gone through the JD, uh, we are looking for someone who is good in uh, a lot of things. Uh, someone who has worked on Azure DevOps, you already know about it, Azure and 
the main thing is that our application uses uh, uh, Kubernetes a lot. So as mm -hmm. the HR conveyed the same that this would be strictly on Kubernetes, uh, not much, uh, I mean, not more than 30, 40 minutes of interview, but this would be highly concentrated on Kubernetes only. All right. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'll start with the uh, scenario based question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Consider a company uh, built some kind of monolithic architecture that handles a lot of products. Okay. Now mm -hmm. company is expanding and mm -hmm. today today's industry is scaling. So companies ex is expanding and then monolithic uh, architecture started causing problems. So mm -hmm. uh, how do you think the company should shift it from monolithic to microservices and how do how do they deploy their containers? How can they implement Kubernetes in it? So I hope you are aware about monolithic and microservices architecture, right? Uh, right, right. Oh, okay, yeah. great. So uh, how do you think that company should shift from monolithic to microservice and uh, how can they club Kubernetes in it? Okay, so first of all, I want to share light on microservices. So it is a distributed and loosely coupled uh, applications, like different application are loosely coupled. It's not same in monolithic. So it will ha have the team to change and don't break the entire app when we are moving from uh, one, it's like from one server to different servers. So for that, we can use orchestration tool, which is a Kubernetes platform. So they can start by migrating their services once or twice and monitor them to make sure that everything is running stable. And if everything is working fine, we can migrate using Kubernetes cluster. So basically, uh, the solution of all these uh, is using Kubernetes. Okay. So uh, you folks are implementing it or uh, your seniors or the whole team? Uh, no, whole, like our work is basically monitoring uh, the Kubernetes cluster and everything is created. But if we have to like uh, see if memory is full, so we can change the memory values. Like recently I was working on something and it was not getting up. So we have to change the replica set. So we do these kind of things. Okay. Okay. Great. We'll talk about that uh, later. Okay. Uh, can you explain me the uh, Kubernetes architecture? Uh, yeah, so Kubernetes mainly consists of two components, we can say one is master node and the second one is uh, worker node. So in master node itself, there are four components. One is called Kube Control Manager, Kube mm -hmm. API Server, and one is Kube Scheduler and ETCD. So uh, by the name, we can understand from Control Manager is first of all, it is inside master node. So it uh, manages the multiple process which are running on a master node. And it is combined all the uh, processes together and they let in let inform uh, master node that what's happening. So it basically manages all the processes. That's why it's called control manager. Second one is API server, Kube API server. So it acts as front end of master node. So it exposes all the API of Kubernetes to master node component and is responsible for like creating communication between uh, master node and worker node. And Third one is scheduler. So again, from name, we can understand that it schedules like work for the worker node as it is inside master node. So it will schedule work for different worker nodes. That's why it's called scheduler. And the last one, which is inside master node is ETCD. Mm -hmm. So it is written in Go programming language and it's basically key values to store it. Like there will be some key like username and password. So if we have to store it in it, it inside Kubernetes, then we'll mainly store it inside ETCD. Okay, so these mm -hmm. are four components which are for master node, and there it co again come worker node. So mm -hmm. inside worker node, we have two components. One is called kubelet, and the second one is called kube proxy. So kubelet is again primary node for worker node, and it runs for each of the nodes. And kube proxy is a network proxy that again run on each of the nodes and implement the services which will come from master node. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is the basic architecture. Okay, great, great, great. Um, so, uh, so there is something known as Docker Swarm. Have you heard about it? Yeah, it is a container orchestration tool. Similar yeah, like yeah, yeah, just like, just like Kubernetes. So, uh, mm -hmm. like as a, let's say if you, if you are in a position to take decision, uh, why should I choose Kubernetes and why shouldn't I go with uh, Docker Swarm? Yeah. So earlier, uh, Docker Swarm came, it like people used to work on that, but there are some drawbacks which is available in Docker Swarm. That's why we twist to Kubernetes. Uh, first of all, it's very simple to install Docker Swarm. We can't deny the fact, but it, the cluster is not robust. While setting up the Kubernetes, it's very complicated. But once you uh, like set up that thing, that, that Kubernetes, then it's very easy to work on that. 
and the cluster is robust. Second thing is like in Kubernetes, we can do auto scaling. Like we don't have to go and check manually if we have to auto scale. Uh, even while right now I'm working on Kubernetes, so if some pod dies, it will automatically create new one. We don't have a tension or in back of mind, okay, we have to go and change it. But that's not the case in Docker Swarm. And again, in Kubernetes, we can uh, deploy a rolling update and it will automatically do rollbacks. But mm -hmm. that is a not, again not in the case of Docker Swarm. We have to do it manually. And one okay. best thing uh, which I think in Kubernetes is like we have tools for logging and monitoring. Like we can uh, connect with Prometheus and all in Kubernetes, but that is not the case in Docker Swarm. We have to use external tools. But in you can, uh, sorry, Kubernetes, it's not there. There is already built-in tool available for logging and monitoring. So okay, that's why. Uh, so what is that built-in built-in tool? Uh, like we can integrate uh, Kubernetes, uh, sorry, Prometheus, Grafana, Loki for logging and monitoring in Kubernetes. Okay, what is this Loki? I've never heard about it. Uh, it's a logging tool like uh, in Grafana after the dashboard. Mm -hmm. And in Grafana, we have integrated Loki and it will take the logs. Like if I want to take the log of seven days, what's happening on particular cluster, mm -hmm. then we have to go and Loki and it will show us all the logs available there. Like for past 10 days, 30 days, 10 hours, whatever time you want, you can see there in Grafana dashboard. Okay. Okay. Great. Learned something new today. Okay. So uh, based on the first question, uh, I'm just... Uh, uh, curious about it, uh, the monolithic and the microservices architecture that you have worked on. So, uh, see, all of us uh, know that uh, that microservices will solve the problem, right? And for the development side, people will be, uh, write their own services. But don't you think that uh, when you, as a DevOps engineer, when you do the deployment, right? So, mm -hmm. it can increase the problem for you folks. So, how can you or your company or organization solve this problem on the deployment side? Okay, uh, so like again, uh, the same thing, we can say the solution is again the Kubernetes only. Uh, so the company can generate a templated application and deploy it within five minutes. And the actual instances which got created uh, will be used in Kubernetes. So like the project, Kubernetes project have dozens of microservices running in parallel, which is not available in Docker Swarm again. That's the benefit of using Kubernetes. So we can run dozen of uh, microservices in parallel, which will improve the production rate. And even if a node goes down, as I informed earlier only, like uh, it can uh, do rolling update, rollback. So even if like there's a lot of pressure on one particular node, it will it will go down or if it will die by any means, the new node will get up and it will work. So it will reschedule immediately without uh, impacting the performance. So the, in this way, it will be helpful for DevOps guy. Like we don't have to go and check manually. Uh, Kubernetes is doing our work by using a rollbacks or deploy, rolling deployments. Okay, have you ever done that? Like, or like it does it automatically, Kubernetes does it automatically? No, it's the, uh, it do it automatically. Like we don't have to do anything. Okay. I have seen it happening. Like okay. if I kill any pod, it will mm -hmm. start automatically. I don't have to go and update it, like make it up. Okay, so Kubernetes is intelligent enough, you're saying? Yeah. Okay, great, great. Um, so, uh, what are all the services that you have uh, worked on Kubernetes, and can you explain a few of them? Uh, yeah, I haven't like I have theoretical knowledge about the services available mm -hmm. in Kubernetes, but practically I haven't got chance to work as of now on any service. But not, I have not not knowledge. not even a single service. Uh, no, as of now, okay. like I know about like I have seen it's already done there. Load mm -hmm. balancer is one of the services which we are using, mm -hmm. but I haven't done anything in that. So, okay. but there are basically four type of uh, services mm -hmm. in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. uh, first one, we can say cluster IP. Mm -hmm. It basically exposes the services on the cluster internal IP. Mm -hmm. And the node port, it, it again, the same thing, but it uh, exposes service on the basis of nodes. Mm -hmm. It exposes service on nodes IP. Like one is cluster, then there's a load node. So like that. And the third one is load balancer. So it again from name we can understand it exposes the services and help in load balancing to the cloud providers. Oh, load balancing and for what actually? Services. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and the fourth one external name it will help to map the services 
to the content of external name field by returning a C name record. So again, what is C name record? Mm -hmm. uh, it is basically like it helps to map the domain one domain to another domain. Mm -hmm. So that is that C name record. So okay. these are the four services available. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So consider your company only. Okay. Now, uh, so your manager, your technical manager uh, wants to uh, optimize the distribution of the workloads. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you, are, you folks are not using, uh, you are, you, let's say you are on some legacy systems or something. Okay. So mm -hmm. how can I use Kubernetes over here to achieve the distribution of resources efficiently? So again, uh, I don't think how in the solution of this question is again, Kubernetes only mm -hmm. as it is uh, like that much intelligent, it will be able to shift like as it has service with the name of load balancers. So it will automatically uh, balance whatever work is coming on on any particular node. If one again, I have already informed if one node has so much of the pressure or so much work that's getting killed or some health issue regarding to that particular node, it's not working. So uh, it will get killed and the new node will get up or new pods will get created and the uh, work will get distributed. So again, the solution is Kubernetes only. It acts as an orchestration tool, which will be used for distribution of workloads and it will do it automatically. It's intelligent enough. Okay. So you were talking something about a uh, load balancer, right? So what do you understand by load balancer in, in, in terms of Kubernetes only? Okay, so uh, yeah, so in load balancers, there are two types of load balancer again. One is internal and the external load balancers. So internal load balancer automatically balances loads and allocates the pods with the required configurations. So internal means like inside node, there are many pods. So if, if in what, like there's two nodes, node A and node B, and we have to distribute work inside node A. And inside node A, there are 10 pods available. So the work of lo internal load balancer will be to allocate the pods with different configuration, their assigned particular work. And in external load balancer, it directs the traffic coming from external load to the backend pods. So like from name, we can understand what's happening. In external load balancer, uh, work is distributed between nodes and in internal load balancer, the work is distributed between pods in one in particular one nodes. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, have you ever heard about uh, an application known as Quick Ride? Yeah. Uh, so it was basically a carpooling, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So consider uh, you are a uh, you are an employee of car uh, this carpooling company called Quick Ride and. Uh, you are in their DevOps and SRE team. Okay. Now they want to increase the number of uh, servers. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they want to just simultaneously scale their platform. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, think that your organization or you can suggest uh, that the company will deal with the servers and then installation and everything? How, how can Kubernetes be helpful over here? Yeah, so again, the solution is containerization and orchestration. So once they use Kubernetes for orchestration or and use monitoring tool like Prometheus to monitor the action of their container, that will be helpful. So with the use of container, it will give them better capacity planning in their data center. And uh, yeah, by using Kubernetes, they can see uh, what's going on and using Prometheus to monitor the actions of their containers. So in this way, they can okay. work on this. Yeah. So you have worked on Prometheus as well, right? Uh, yeah, little bit. So both Prometheus and Grafana? <clears throat> yes. So uh, are they clubbed together or they are both separate entities uh, in, in your organization? Uh, no, no, they are separated. Uh, in my current organization, we are mm -hmm. not using as much of Prometheus. We are more concentrated on Grafana and Loki. Grafana and Loki. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. Uh, what do you understand by a namespace in Kubernetes? Yeah. So like before, like practically working on Kubernetes, it was really difficult and, mm -hmm. and confusing for me to understand what is namespace. Like I was not understanding, but when now I'm working practically, I'm getting to understand how useful it is. Okay. And okay. so it is used for uh, dividing cluster resources between multiple users. Like I am a person, I'm working on something and I want a particular cluster only for me, only I can access that. I am doing some POC. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing some real work. So I'll create, first of all, I create a namespace. There's a command for that to create a namespace. Mm -hmm. 
uh, cube CTL create minus n and then whatever name you want. Like if I am uh, creating namespace for Prometheus, uh, sorry, I am creating a cluster for Prometheus. So I'll create a namespace with the name monitoring. That will be helpful, right? Mm -hmm. So while doing POC, I'll do cube CTL create minus n minus n represent namespace mm -hmm. monitoring. Mm -hmm. So one namespace will get created with the name monitoring. Mm -hmm. And inside that, I'll create a cluster with any name Prometheus, say, for example. Mm -hmm. And inside that, there will be nodes and pods available. So when I'm doing POC, if only I can see, and I have given the access that only I can see that particular namespace. So I'll go and work there. So that particular namespace means like a workspace thing. Mm -hmm. There only I'll go, I'll do my work. No other person can go and check into what is available in that particular namespace. Even mm -hmm. if they click on namespace, they'll see no pods or no uh, nodes cluster available. It will be blank for them. So it's a particular workspace that is assigned to me only. So in this way, namespace is useful. It helps to divide the resources between multiple uh, users. Uh, and we can also use namespace for different environment. Like for dev environment, one particular set of namespaces is available, which is only will be available for what dev environment, not for production environment. So in this way, it helps in bifurcation. OK. Yeah. OK, OK, OK. Uh, what is the purpose? Uh, what is the purpose of operator uh, in Kubernetes? Yeah. So yeah, I have recently learned this, and it's a really cool feature available only in uh, Kubernetes. Okay. So uh, yeah, so it provides the capability of managing the application and their component using a term called custom resources. Again, like before mm -hmm. using uh, operators, uh, we used to like if I want uh, like. If I want open search, open search is again to get the logs. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, earlier we used to call it elastic search, but then Amazon AWS actually uh, copied the elastic search thing, and you and they said that it's their copyright. They they have created elastic search, but it's not like that. Mm -hmm. So there was some conflict happened, and then they created the they have the copy of elastic search only, but they have taken their own copyright and changed its name to open search. So uh, sorry, if, sorry, sorry, I didn't catch the last part. Change their name to open search. Yeah, like Elasticsearch is used to take the logs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is the Elasticsearch is dif different, entirely different thing, different company, and they have created Elasticsearch. Okay, and mm -hmm. it's open source; everyone can use it, like Sonar Cube. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. But but AWS was also using that, but they were not giving proper credit to Elasticsearch company, which was uh, using it. Okay. They they were taking it as their own tools. Then some problem happened between these two company and last and Amazon AWS has created their own Elasticsearch thing exactly mm -hmm. similar mm -hmm. the one we used before mm -hmm. and named it as Open Search and then said okay it's my own my entity like I have created it okay okay yeah so yeah so that is Open Search we so now like as of now in my company we are using Open Search we are not using Elasticsearch although both are typically same thing. Okay, so, so like, you mean the base is same? Yeah, yeah. So uh, like I'm giving example, like when we use open search, like if I have to create an open search, we usually go to Helm charts. It's mm -hmm. like a Git repository thing only. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can create, we have to go and manually run some set of commands and then your open search uh, cluster will get created. Mm -hmm. But now we have a solution in Kubernetes. We have operators. And what that mm -hmm. operator do, it will it will help to automate the deployment like all the things which we require to create open search will automatically created by uh, operator we don't have to go manually and run uh, run each and every resources is the work of oper operator it will get to know whatever things are required to deploy open search it will download it and it will create it okay so yeah so that is operator and its main purpose i guess okay okay uh, so in the last uh, question, you answered something related to Sonar Cube. So uh, you have must have worked upon Sonar Cube as well, right? Yes, in okay. my previous company. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, Sonar Cube is uh, kind of something up, not exactly, but people say a part of security, and there is a mm -hmm. term known as DevSecOps, right? Yes. You must have heard about it. Ah, uh, yeah. In my current company, our project is DevSecOps only. We are focused on security part mainly. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, so let's talk about the security then. Uh, so, what are the various things uh, that you can do uh, to increase the security in Kubernetes? Okay. So as we already know, like by default, we know that pod can communicate with each other, and it can create network policy. Like so, 
it's not good like for security reason we have to uh, limit it that the pod don't communicate with each other like all pods don't communicate with each other mm-hmm. yeah generally for security reasons so we have to set up some network policies to limit this communication between pods and there are some ways by which we can do that like first of all uh, first one we can say is rbac role based access control like to narrow down the permission uh, which pod can access which uh, or access or communicate to which other pod and the second one the i already informed you about name spaces mm-hmm, we can mm-hmm. create different name spaces and we'll give permissions like okay that in uh, the second like in one name space uh, for example name space a has some pod they can't have access to uh, communicate with name space in pod b name space b so we can bifurcate using name spaces and the third one is to create policies like we have some privileged containers like we'll give policy that this particular container is privileged one and all pod cannot communicate to that and the fourth one which is a normal one is turn on audit logging so these are some of the way which we can by which we can limit the communication between our pods and which indirectly uh, increase the security of kubernetes okay so have you ever uh, worked on this uh, pipelines uh, uh, have you ever integrated your pipelines with sonar cube for the security part as well Uh, yes in my last company i did that oh, so what was the ci that you folks were using or the ci tool uh, as your tip off i i was working on okay 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 no problem let's circle back um so you were talking about uh, logs a lot uh, that you folks were using loki uh, and uh, prometheus and grafana so mm-hmm. if i want to get the central logs from any pod how do i do that uh so it depends really on many factors so uh, some of the common logging pattern which we use as of now in my company is like uh, using no- node level logging agent which will give us information on node levels like we'll get logged there and as i've already informed we are using a grafana dashboard there and like if i want to get information for past 7 days past 8 days we can go on grafana da- dashboard and we have integrated it with kubernetes and we can get result there and the third one we can say is streaming sidecar containers and sorry uh, what what streaming sidecar sidecar containers okay yeah. okay okay and we can again we can like this one is easy one which we can directly also export logs from the application like even if we go on kubernetes there is a like in the pod we have three dots there available at the last and from there we can get the logs and we can export it directly also in our system so yeah in this way we can get get the logs okay 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 uh what do you understand by ingress uh, default backend uh okay so it specifies uh, what to do with the incoming request to the kubernetes cluster that mm-hmm. isn't mapped to the backend like uh if there is no rule defined like what to be do and done if some incoming http request is there and there is no rule defined what to be uh, like on which node or in which port we have to schedule that request in that case uh, ingress default backend will come into use and it will specify where we have to uh, divert or send that incoming request uh yeah so but it is recommended to define it okay so you folks Uh, ha- have you ever done it or like your senior or something or someone some someone from the team uh no i don't know uh, but yeah we get the clear message so i guess someone has done but if you haven't done you will get some unclear message and will not understand what's happening but as of now if any such kind of incident happen we'll get clear message okay this is happening so i guess some some of the senior has done but not in like when i came i don't know that okay yeah. okay okay fair enough fair enough okay uh let's say uh, uh you have a junior in your team who is very new okay and he who is very new in terms of kubernetes okay mm-hmm. and uh, he doesn't know much about it so his pod is not getting scheduled or something okay and he comes to you so mm-hmm. like how would you how would you tell him that or her that uh, how to troubleshoot it yeah so first of all there can be many reasons that can lead to unstartable pods mm-hmm. so like first we should go and like check the logs and see what the issue happening but mm-hmm. once we know the issue then only we can solve that so the command we can use to see what's happening in particular pod which is not getting started is like we have to use command kubectl mm-hmm. describe 
mm-hmm. particular pod which is not ra- running we have to write the name mm-hmm. again we have to specify the name space in which it's not it's running so minus n and the name space name so once you write kubectl describe pod and mm-hmm. the name space you can see the reason why pod is not starting and according to that there can be many reason why pod is not starting like uh, as i said today only like the, like there are two two pods only available so mm-hmm. the memory is gone so i uh, r cpu like only two cpu is uh, given for a particular pod so mm-hmm. first we'll do this describe pod then we'll get to know okay how many uh, how much memory it's taking how many cpu assigned to that and we can change it like it's not working we can cha- how many replicas it assigned if two is assigned we can change to 10 if memory is this we can change it so there can be many reasons but the most like i'll suggest first do this command mm-hmm. see what uh, what the issue is and solve it accordingly and then come back to you hmm? yeah okay 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 uh, so is there any way uh, to provide external network connectivity to to kubernetes Uh, okay i'll just uh, reiterate the question uh, is there any way to provide external network connectivity to kubernetes uh yeah it is there but right now i'm not able to recall that okay okay no problem no problem okay uh, so this would be uh, my last question for today uh, how can we forward the port 8080 and consider this uh, in a container okay to mm-hmm. a service and then to a ingress and then to a browser okay let me just reiterate it container to service to ingress to the browser everyone is using 8080 as a port but browser is using 80 how can we do this and i'm telling you it's possible how can we do it okay so uh, the ingress is exporting exposing port 80 externally from the browser to mm-hmm. access and mm-hmm. to connect to a service that listens on 8080 Okay, so the ingress will listen to port eighty by default. So as an ingress controller, it is a pod that receives external traffic and handle the ingress and is configured in the ingress resources. So for this, uh, I guess we need uh, ingress selector, uh, which will help us to forward uh, these uh, ports. Yeah, I'm not sure, but I guess it will. Like in ingress controller will help in this. Okay. 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 Fair enough. Fair enough. Um. Uh, yeah. I think I'm done. Do you have any questions for me? Uh. Yeah. So. Uh. What is the role of DevOps engineer there, and uh, how much work is on Kubernetes in your company as of now? Okay. So. Uh. Right now. Uh. First of all, this position that we are looking for is not on my project. So if you will get selected, you won't be working in my project. Uh. We are uh, recruiting for some other project. and it's heavily based on uh, uh kubernetes so probably we'll be using either uh, we have not decided yet so that's where you folks come in uh, there are a few people we still need to hire and then uh, we will be deciding either we have to go with aks eks or something else and uh, we might do a poc on something that what is better for the application so i might be a part of it but i'm not the part of project uh, that's for sure so uh, i think this is your second round so uh, okay so uh, yeah we would be using kubernetes that's for sure but uh, how are we dealing with it and how are we implementing it that's not decided yet so that's where new folks and the architects come in okay oh, so right. thank um, you uh, did did i did i answer your question uh yeah pretty much okay 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 thanks a lot uh, then the hr will come back to you okay bye have a great day ahead bye bye thank you